the files for our uh, Jupyter Notebook. You can go ahead and download those too if you want to uh, run the code along with us. Hello, everybody. My name is Javier. I am a fifth year transfer majoring in electrical engineering, and I'm also in the BSMS program. So I'll be getting my master's in circuits and systems pretty soon. Um, I am the current electrical lead for Triton RoboSub. And on the left, uh, we have our website and our social media. Please feel free to follow us on Facebook or join our Discord. I'm excited to present to you this introductory workshop in digital signal processing with my colleague, Andrew. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew, and I am an electrical team member for Trian RoboSub, and I am also an officer for Neurotech at UCSD. And if you want to learn more about Neurotech at UCSD, you can feel free to check out our, the links to our website, Facebook, and Discord channel at the bottom right of this slide. So here's the uh, layout for the workshop. And so uh, we're first going to start out with talking about what digital signal processing is. Then we're going to talk about the breadth and depth of DSP. So therefore, we will be talking about telecommunications, audio processing, localization, and image and signal processing. Then we'll go into the fundamental knowledge topics. So here's where we will dive more into linear systems, convolution, and discrete Fourier transforms. And then finally, we'll end the, the workshop with a demonstration on audio filter. Linear systems are very powerful because we are able to get the output of weird signals using something we call superposition. So let's say that we have a weird signal, x of n. You might notice that it sort of looks like a funky sine wave. It kind of gets added in the middle, and it has a little dip at the end. Well, we can actually decompose this signal into what we just mentioned, the sine wave. So here's the middle and the dip at the end. Now, here's the important part, though. The output signal obtained by inputting all these individual signals is identical to the one produced by directly passing the complicated input signal through the system. Now, this is a very powerful idea. Why? Because instead of trying to understand how complicated signals are changed by a system, all we need to know is how simple signals are modified. Now, in the jargon of signal processing, the input and output signals are viewed as a superposition or the sum of simpler sine waves. This is the basis of nearly all signal processing techniques. And finally, when you add all the signals together, you just get the synthesis of it. So speaking of decomposition, there are a number of ways you can actually decompose a signal, such as even odd decomposition, where you split it into its even signals and odd signals, or step decomposition, where you split it into a bunch of step functions. However, uh, we're going to look at impulse decomposition. So take a look at this sampled signal. Each of those dots represents the value of the signal at a particular sample time. Look at the start of the signal or the zeroth sample. This is the impulse of just that zeroth sample, and we can go back and see. And now take a look at the first sample. That is, this is the impulse of that first point. And now the second. So impulse decomposition is pretty intuitive to understand, and you can go on and on for all the samples. And here's the 27th, for example. So impulse decomposition is important because it allows signals to be examined one sample at a time. And using superposition, you just add all of the results together. Similarly, systems are characterized by how they respond to impulses. By knowing how a system responds to a single impulse, the system's output can be calculated for any given input. And this approach is called convolution. And convolution is the mathematical framework for all of DSP. And it's the most important technique of DSP. Uh, we're going to talk about this pretty soon. OK, so impulse response. The impulse function is actually a huge pulse at the sample number 0. However, the delta function is just a normalized impulse function. So in other words, it has a value of 1. 
at sample number zero and a value of zero everywhere else. Now let's put this in, let's put this delta function in a linear system. The output of this system is known as the impulse response of the linear system. Every unique linear system has a unique impulse response. Now in different applications of DSP, this impulse response might be called something else. If the system is a filter, then the impulse response is called the filter kernel, the convolution kernel, or just simply kernel. In image processing, the impulse response is called the point spread function. All of these mean the same thing, but they are actually used in slightly different ways. In summary, linear system, or in summary, in linear systems, convolution is used to describe the relationship between three signals of interest, the input signal X of N, the impulse response H of N, and the output signal Y of N. Just as addition is represented by the plus and multiplication is represented by the cross, convolution is represented by the star. And it's a formal mathematical operation just as multiplication, addition, integration, differentiation, or the dot product, for example. Okay. So let's just take a look at a couple of examples of input signals convoluted with an impulse response, and let's see what the output is. So in this example, we have an input signal that looks like a rising sine wave. It is being convoluted with a delta with an amplitude of negative 0.5. Let's just see uh, what the actual answer is. So basically, even without doing the math, we can intuitively reason what it could look like. So the amplitude of the impulse response is negative. So it is probably going to be, it is probably going to flip the input. The amplitude of the impulse response is also half. So the output is probably going to be scaled by half. Now, as you notice, the delta is time shifted by 15. So the output will also be shifted by 15. And here's the output. It is flipped, halved, and shifted by 15, just as we predicted. Now let's take a look at another example. So now there are two deltas. The first one has a magnitude of 1, and the second has a magnitude of negative 1. The first delta is very close to the second. OK, well. Let's actually take a dive as to, let's take a deeper dive as to what the answer is. So basically, let's try to think of this intuitively. Now, using superposition, do all of you agree that we are subtracting the second delta from the first? Okay. And also, the first delta is approaching the second. One might say that we are taking the limits as the first sample approaching the second of the difference or the formula portrayed on this uh, slide uh, right now. This is actually the discrete derivative. A lot of systems can be realized with simple impulse responses, which is actually very powerful. And by comparison, here are the two outputs. You could have also done superposition of this first output. You just basically have to rescale the signal back to its original magnitude and subtract it, shift it by one. So taking the same input signal, let's convolute it with these two impulse responses. So it's not going to be easy to immediately see what they do. However, I chose these two examples because they are very important in uh, filters. Maybe give you some hints. So in the first one, uh, the amplitudes of the deltas are all very low. Uh, it's, not, it's not letting much pass through. And in the second one, they're all very low as well, except for the single delta that has an amplitude of one. And in the previous exa example, we saw that a single delta with an amplitude of negative one convoluted with an input resulted in almost the same signal just flipped. So in this one, we have a single delta with amplitude of one. So we should expect the same input, just somehow change the bit by the rest of the attenuated deltas. So the first one is a low pass filter, and the second one is a high pass filter. And in the first output, 
all the high frequencies got filtered out and we are left with a low frequency ramp. In the second output, the high frequency got let through, but the low frequency component got filtered out. So we are left with the high frequency sine wave. It was very hard guys. And honestly, you just can't, it, it's very hard to see um, just by looking at the impulse response, you actually have to go ahead and do the math. Okay, so to first uh, get to know a little bit of our organizations, let's first start about uh, getting to know Neurotech at UCSD. So Neurotech at UCSD is a club affiliated with a neurotechnology nonprofit organization called Neurotech X. Our clubs actually started in January 2020 um, with the fa faculty advisorship of Professor Fikash Gilja of the TNEL Research Group. Our club has connections with a neuro headset company called Wearable Sensing. Our club participates in annual NTX student competitions, and the mission of our club is to bring together students interested in neurotechnology and provide ways to get involved in the field. And a little bit about Trident RoboSub. We were actually founded Prudent recently as well. We debuted in 2018 and got to the semifinals at the yearly International RoboSub competition held at the NWIC Pacific Transtech Pool. Aside from competing, we also do research with scripts and in conjunction with engineers for exploration. A current project we are doing right now is working on developing a handheld tool to measure fish population. And in RoboSub, we do a little bit of everything from mechanical engineering and fabrication to computer science and machine learning and simulations to electrical engineering and circuit building and of course, doing some digital signal processing. 